and welcome back to my philosophical and musical channel. What can be love for us and what does it mean to inspire, to be inspired uh, thanks to this incredible, amazing feeling. And uh, Symposium of Plato is the theme for today. By the way, Eris is a very ancient god, of course, he is ketonic tonic god and the etymology of his name is connected with the verb to desire to strive in greek eromai uh, and um, it turns out that it turns out that eros has some aspiration and can love inspire and encourage you to do some things to improve your own nature or maybe it can awaken in a person his or her own nature and um, after all this nature is not always so benevolent and benevolent so generous for example i can remember uh, the russian play of ostrovsky named forest and um, it's the example of the wishes force of love so it's not clear for today for me to tell the truth this symposium uh, is a philosophical text by Plato. It was written uh, about 385, 317 before Christianity. And this text in is incredibly beautiful and poetic. And it's not often possible to meet these two qualities in combination, to tell the truth, and in combination with philosophical depth. So, therefore, this dialogue, of course, is especially uh, loved by many connoisseurs of literature and Greek lit literature and um, connoisseurs of beauty, of course. And, in fact, this text is a collection of speeches in praise of this ancient god Eros. Such feasts among, among the ancient Greeks were very common, very usual, and um, they were often held as a way to philosophize and to discuss something very deep and very tough, maybe, and very openly. Uh, so, the dialogue's seven main characters who deliver major speeches are uh, at first, uh, Phaedrus. Phaedrus, uh, Phaedrus is an Athenian aristocrat, uh, aristocrat associated with the inner circle of the philosopher Socrates. And um, we have known him um, thanks to dialogue. Pedrus. Uh, then Pausanius. Pausanius, he is the legal expert. expert. Eryximachus, uh, he was something like natural philosopher and medicine and uh, physician. Aristophanes, the eminent comic playwright, uh, he, he was written, he has written this famous play named Rocks. Agathon, a tragic poet, a host of the banquet, that celebrates the triumph of his first play, his first, first tragedy. Uh, Socrates himself, uh, this eminent philosopher, uh, and uh, Alcibiades, a prominent Athenian statesman, military and general and or orator and so on and so forth. It's interesting to note uh, some theatricality and dramaturgy of this play, of this dialogue. And the center here, of course, is the speech of Socrates. Um, he is a kind of semantic note or um, the point of the golden section, maybe. And um, it's also not noteworthy that the center of Socrates' speech is the speech of Diatima. And Diatima is a very mysterious character, to tell the truth. Um, her name can be translated as revered by gods, by Zeus. And uh, if you remember Baetus, he was the latest ancient philosopher, uh, philosopher of antiquity. And um, his wonderful and famous book named Consolation of Philosophy. 
Uh, then an interesting associative uh, series may arise in your memory, because after all, Baetius in his um, famous book depicted uh, this personalized philosophy, this beautiful woman in self-woven clothes, and she instructs and comforts a philosopher uh, sentenced to death. So, in, in fact, uh, all the people in the world are condemned to leave this world, so we are all in, in an equal position. Uh, and the question is the intensity of the days lived here and not in their total number, I think. And uh, what can Eris add as a great force and great driving force of love? And what can philosophy do for us? And music, by the way, it's also the driving force, I think. But it's turn to the dialogue and um, each speaker sings a panegyric to Eros. And according to his life and his profession and his mind, I think. Federus, whom we know from the dialogue of the same names, of the same name, begins this phrase, and I quote, first in the train of gods he fashioned love, and Acusilaus agrees with Hesio, these numerals are the witnesses who acknowledge love to be the eldest of the gods, and not only is he the eldest, he is also the source of the greatest benefits to us, so the greatest benefits here are the courage and generosity of human nature and um, for the principle which ought to be the guide of man who would nobly, nobly live at principle. I say, neither kinder nor honor nor wealth nor any other motive is able to implant so well as love and errors as a force encourages and bravery um, and that is Eros here is a kind of inspiring beginning that can make almost a hero some kind of human being. Pausanius introduces a dialectical point of view and dialectical point with his speech he talks about the duality of Aphrodite and Eros accordingly to Aphrodite. I quote, and I am not right in asserting that they are two goddesses. The elder one, having no mother, who is called the heavenly Aphrodite, she is the daughter of Uranus. The younger, who is the daughter of Zeus and Dion, here we can call common or Pandemos, by the way, uh, and the love who is her fellow worker is rightly named common, as the other love is called heavenly. So, there is an aspiration more vulgar and base, and um, it's uh, connected with the body, and we have more um, higher. Uh, yeah, we have the, the highest form of love, um, according to Pausanius, to the soul and love for the soul and virtue. And these motives will be developed uh, by Socrates a little bit later. Euriximachus, he talks about the power of love that is spread throughout nature. He is a nature, nature philosopher. Yeah and the love more especially which is concerned with the good and which is perfected in company with temperance and justice, whether among gods or men, has the greatest power and is the source of all our happiness and harmony and makes us friends with the gods who are above us and with one another. So, Love is something like united force, as you can see. Aristophan, Aristophanes, who finally got rid to the hiccups that tormented him, and um, 
which prevented him from speaking. It tells about the myths of integral people and is one of the most famous myths uh, from Plato's dialogues, you know, I quote, Now the sexes were three, and such as I have described them, because the sun, moon, and earth are three, and the man was originally the child of the sun, the woman of the earth, and the man woman of the moon, which is made up of sun and earth, and they were all round and moved round and round, like their parents circles. <laughs> Terrible was their might and strength, and the thoughts of their hearts were great, and they made an attack upon the gods. Of them is told the tale of Otis and Ephialtes, who, as Homer says, dared to scale heaven and would have laid hands upon the gods. So Zeus uh, decided to separate these very two bravery people, and they were separated by Zeus and suffered so much uh, that the gods had to come up with this, this possibility of connecting the lost halves. And that is happened, and Eros is the desire to find the integrity of our no, our own existence, our own inner nature, you know. Agathon. Agathon and his speech may be regarded as self-consciously poetic and rhetorical, of course, and um, it is composed in the way of the sophist, gently mocked by Socrates. And Agathon paints her as, as an eternally, eternally young and beautiful god, but this is exactly what Socrates refutes after this speech. So, Socrates says that the question is why strive for what you already have? If the, this Eros is already so young and so beautiful, what is the reason for to strive to this beauty? And Agathon agrees that there is no need, it's nonsense. Uh, so, Ares is not so young and not so beautiful. Uh, he's ambivalent and he comes from completely different parents. His father, the god of wealth and the right path, is Poros. By the way, uh, the word Aporia is derived from this name Poros. And uh, the mother is the goddess of poverty and insufficiency, Penea. Uh, so, Diotima says, on the birthday of Aphrodite, there was a feast of the gods, at which the god Poros, or Plenty, who is the son of Metis and Discretion, was one of the guests. When the feast was over, Penea, or poverty, as the manner is on such occasions, came about the doors to back. Now plenty who was the worse for nectar, there was no wine in those days, went into the garden of Zeus and fell into a heavy sleep and poverty, considering her own straitened circumstances, plotted to have a child by him, and accordingly she laid down at his side and conceived love, who partly because he is naturally a lover of the beautiful and because Aphrodite is herself beautiful and also because he was born on her birthday, is her and is her follower and attendant. And as his parentage is, so also are his fortunes. In the first place, he is always poor and anything but tender, lies tender and fair as they imagine him, and he is rough and squalid, and has no shoes nor a house to dwell in. On the bare earth exposed he lies under the open heaven, in the streets, or at the doors of houses, taking his rest, and like his mother, he is always in distress, 
Like his father to whom he also partly resembles, he is always plotting against the fair and good. He is bold, enterprising, strong and a mighty hunter, always waving some in intrigue or other, keen in the pursuit of wisdom, fertile, fertile in resources, a philosopher and all times terrible as an enchanter, sorcerer, sophist. Uh, it's interesting that in this speech Socrates builds such a ladder of beauty and we see that uh, the philosopher is, he, uh, is some, somebody who, strive, who strives to their wisdom. He is something in between like Eros. And um, neither do the ignorant seek after wisdom, for wisdom is a most beautiful thing, and love is worth the beautiful. And therefore, love is also a philosopher. Eros is a philosopher for Plato. And about letter of beauty, we contemplate a sensual reality at first. Sensual reality, a beautiful body and loving. Then we begin to love the soul and uh, the soul for its beauty, for moral um, beauty and for moral advantages, advantages. After that, the love of contemplating the beautiful in the form of sciences. We strive to the sciences, uh, pure speculations awakens to the philosophy and only at the end we can see what is inaccessible to the ordinary eyes, uh, good and beauty as the highest ideas, eidos, you, you know this, this word for Plato was very significant, is the key word, eidos. So the final speech is by Alcibiades, uh, who sings a panegyric to Socrates and his virtue, uh, to Socrates himself and his valorous advantages, virtues and so on and so forth. And they are direct reference to the retinue of Dionysus, by the way, as Alcibiades compares Socrates uh, with the companion of Dionysus, moreover, with his teacher, Silen, with Silenus. Silenus or Silen? Silen? I don't know exactly, sorry, uh, how it should be pronounced in English. I'm a beginner with <laughs> Greek's analogies in English. We see some amazing combination of Apollonian and Dionysian principles here, um, which are combined in this dialogue. And uh, although Nietzsche attacked Socrates so far, so far silly, precisely because he was too clearly parent of the Apollonian, Apollonian principle, mm, rational moralizing principle, but here it's not so clear and not so distinguished. Okay, thank you for your attention. I hope that it was something at least, uh, at least useful for you, because I find this test absolutely beautiful. I, I admire Plato and his dialogues and his literary abilities and philosophical depths, depths of course, to Thank you and all good to you, be happy and see you later.